Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. A number of schools in Lethbridge County were closed today, as many in our region continue to deal with the extreme cold temperatures. Outspoken Calgary street preacher Arthur Pulowski explains why he and his brother have launched a multi-million dollar lawsuit. And Prime Minister Justin Trudeau speaks out about South Africa's claim in the International Court that Israel is committing genocide in Gaza. Your nation, your province, your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. The extreme cold continued for Lethbridge today. Now, according to Environment Canada, the bitterly cold temperatures will continue in our region until the early part of next week. In response to the bitterly cold weather, all Holy Spirit Catholic School Division schools were closed today in the rural areas. That included St. Catherine's School in Picture Butte, St. Joseph's School in Coaldale, St. Mary's and St. Patrick's Schools in Tabor, and St. Michael's in Pincher Creek. The bus routes for the rural regions were also cancelled as well. As for bus routes and schools for Holy Spirit Catholic School Division in the city, they were open, as were all of the public schools here in Lethbridge. You know, when you have wind chill values of minus 40 degrees, there are risks involved and associated with being outside for too long, including hypothermia and frostbite. Alberta Health Services says there are warning signs to watch out for to best protect yourself from becoming a victim of the bitterly cold. Uh, exposed skin is a real danger. Uh, in, in environments such as this, we can sort of almost skip right past frost nip, which is sort of just cold, red, irritated skin. Uh, and frostbite can set in which, within in just minutes, really, uh, if you are outside unprotected in an environment where you're not able to get warm or get out of the wind in particular. Hypothermia can also set in in very short order, just minutes even, but to starting in, in generalized body hypothermia can progress rapidly. Climbing ahead is the, is the most uh, uh, benefit you can do uh, when you recognize you do have to be outside uh, when you're dressing appropriately for it so that includes warm insulating layers on the inside and then wind and waterproof layers on the outside uh, but multiple layers help covering all exposed skin at all times including wearing a toque uh, and watching out for the most vulnerable parts of the body sometimes nicknamed the pointy parts which are the high points of your cheek your earlobes tips of your nose and tips of your fingers and toes yeah, very important to cover up, absolutely. Jeanette Roche is now with an early peak of the forecast. Jeanette, we're still under an extreme cold warning from Environment Canada, and the frigid temperatures will continue into the weekend? Yeah, in fact, we'll be seeing wind chill values of minus 50 on Saturday morning and minus 36 by the afternoon. And I don't know if I've ever lived through minus 50 wind chill before, but... That's what we're in for, oh yes, uh, including some ice fog developing tonight, dis dissipating by tomorrow morning. So what is ice fog? Well, ice fog is fog that actually has ice crystals suspended in it. So the good news about that is that it is going to be sunny tomorrow morning, so it might make for some picture perfect uh, situations there. If you happen to catch any of those ice crystals suspended, maybe... Um, Send them our way if you have any pictures of it. Other than that, I'll be back later in the show to tell you the news about next week's weather, and uh, it'll get a bit better, I promise you. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Thanks so much, Jeanette. Lethbridge Police wrapped up their Operation Cold Start campaign. The week-long initiative saw police find 138 vehicles left idling and unlocked here in our city. Now, during the 2022 campaign, only 50 vehicles were left running and unlocked. Operation Cold Start is organized by the Alberta Association of Chiefs of Police. It's a province-wide awareness campaign aimed at preventing vehicle theft. Lethbridge Police have charged a 21-year-old man with dangerous driving. On Wednesday, they caught up with a vehicle traveling 113 kilometers an hour in a 50k zone. The officer was able to catch up with the vehicle after it stopped at a red light. The driver of the vehicle, Liam David Ball of Lethbridge, has been criminally charged with dangerous driving. Is scheduled to appear in court on March the 7th. Paul Viminitz has been fired as a philosophy professor from the University of Lethbridge. You may recall that Viminitz arranged a lecture by former Mount Royal University professor Francis Widowson at the U of L, who is going to speak on wokeism and cancel culture. Now the event was canceled, but when Widowson showed up anyway, her presence was met by a number of protesters. Now, also back in February of last year, a faculty member along with 10 students filed a complaint about Dr. Viminitz's blog. 
An investigation revealed that Viminitz had allegedly violated the U of L's regulations and was let go. Viminitz, in a conversation with Widowson, says he was disappointed that his union didn't step in to help. At that point, there are no procedures uh, that don't involve the faculty association that can, in which this thing can go ahead. So they were, in effect, uh, are, are in fact complicit in this. Exactly. Uh, you know. Um, anyhow, so ever since then, there's been huge amount of procedural <laughs> this is and that. I mean, it's so huge. The file is about 200 pages long. Okay. I haven't read any of it. I don't intend to read any of it. I have no interest in it. Uh, I'm out of it. But the other thing that pissed me off a little bit is that I instructed the faculty association at the very time. I said, uh, when they appointed an investigator, I said, please inform the investigator that the member, me, um, because of the violation of natural justice and because, you know, uh, would not be participating in any way. They waited two months to send the investigator. So the investigator at one point said, hey, I just got this email, you know, two months ago that says that the member's not participating, right? Now, Bridge City News reached out to the University of Lethbridge for comment on Viminitz being let go. In an email, officials said Professor Viminitz's employment was terminated, but they cannot comment further as it is a human resources matter. Outspoken Calgary Street preacher Arthur Pulowski says it's time for Canadians to act. Pulowski spoke out during his press conference in Calgary, where his lawyer announced that Arthur Pulowski and his brother David have launched a lawsuit for $3.5 million against many parties, including the Alberta government, AHS and Calgary police over harms they say they incurred during the COVID-19 lockdowns. Pulowski says so many people were hurt during that period of time, and those who were in charge need to be held accountable. And I'm hoping that thousands of others will join us, the thousands of others that were hurt in this unprecedented attack on our liberties will come and say, if he can do it, if the little Palaskis can do it, that means we can do it as well. And I want to encourage everyone to go after the villains. It's time to make those people accountable for the horror that they have unleashed on us law-abiding Canadians. If they were hurt, if they were attacked by illegal actions of the government or its agents, I uh, encourage them to go and file their own claims. If they cannot do it for whatever reason, I'm encouraging them to come and help us. I mean, we are ready, just like our lawyer said, for 10 year war. We are understanding that this might be millions of dollars, but we are ready for it. We are looking forward to it to uncover this crim criminal enterprise uh, that has unleashed this crazy evil straight from Soviet Russia attack on our liberties. Deputy Prime Minister Christopher Freeland responded to questions by reporters in Toronto asking if the huge influx of recent immigrants to Canada is adding to our housing crisis. You are quite right that if we want to be a country that welcomes new Canadians, and I strongly believe that's the right thing for all of us, we have to build more homes faster. And that's one of the reasons I'm here. Our government is totally committed to getting more homes built for Canadians. You have seen that unrelenting focus for weeks and weeks and weeks, for months and months and months. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says he supports the International Court of Justice, but that doesn't mean his government supports the premise of South Africa's allegations. South Africa launched a case at the top UN court arguing Israel's bombardment of Gaza and its siege on the Palestinian people are genocidal in character. Canada has long been uh, a uh, tremendous supporter of the international rules-based order and the processes and structures that have been put in place uh, over the past decades uh, to be able to actually ensure that international law is respected and enforced. And the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, is uh, a key part of that. Canada right now is uh, directly engaged in at least five different cases at the ICJ because we believe in the importance of uh, that as an institution. But our wholehearted support of the IGA and its processes does not mean uh, that we uh, support the premise of uh, the case brought forward by South Africa. Canada joins the United States, the UK and Germany who have all spoken out against South Africa's case brought against Israel. 
The Jewish nation has denied the genocidal allegations and took the rare step of engaging with the court to defend its international reputation. Tens of thousands of protesters in Yemen marched in solidarity with Gaza as American and UK warships launched waves of missiles at Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen. It was the culmination of weeks of warnings to the rebel group to cease their destructive attacks on commercial vessels in the Red Sea. The Houthi rebels have vowed to retaliate. Reporter John Gabriel with Associated Press explains the details of the U.S.-led strikes that targeted Yemen's Houthi rebels over their ongoing assault on shipping in the Red Sea. A U.S.-led coalition has launched a series of airstrikes targeting Yemen's Houthi rebels. Now, these strikes come after a series of attacks by the Houthis on shipping in the Red Sea. And what we've heard from the Americans is that warships, fighter jets, and even a submarine were involved in launching cruise missiles and other bombs onto targets in Yemen. Those targets included airfields, where the Americans alleged the Houthis launched those bomb-carrying drones that have been harassing shipping for all these weeks. Now, from the Houthi side, we heard from military spokesmen who said five people have been killed and 600 wounded in this attack. However, he did not name those hurt, nor did he say just how bad the damage was. The Americans and their allies had been trying to basically knock out the Houthis' military capability from launching more assaults. The Houthis, however, say they're going to continue their attacks on shipping. The Houthis say that these attacks are pressuring Israel. It say, they say that it's trying to get Israel to stop the war in the Gaza Strip to try to stop the killing of Palestinians who are caught in the crossfire. However, the Houthi attacks are targeting ships that have tenuous, if at any links at all, to Israel. So that's really endangered global shipping, and that's why the Americans say they stepped in. Now, moving forward, there's a fear that this could spark a wider confrontation. The Houthis could fire back. The Americans could then launch another round of retaliatory strikes that could draw in others, like Lebanon's Hezbollah, or even Iran, which so far hasn't been directly involved in the conflict. And meanwhile, all this goes on as Israel's war in Gaza continues. Christian conservatives are a key demographic in the Iowa caucuses. Many still support former U.S. President Donald Trump for restricting access to abortion. Others, however, are disillusioned with Trump after he attacked the anti-abortion movement. Elimination of Roe versus Wade was a huge step in the right direction. That was tremendous what he happened, appointing the judges that, um, that he uh, approved, uh, decided on Dobbs. Um, if he never does anything else on abortion, he did that. Um, and I, don't, I don't know what more he can do. I wouldn't ask him to do any more than that. He did what people have been fighting for for 50 years. That, that, that can be his legacy. He was the first president to actually come to a uh, March for Life event and actually speak there and not be like, oh boy, here, you know, he, he was not afraid to stand there and speak and support. And that's the sort of thing that, that I really liked about Trump. You know, unlike TV programs from the 1990s and earlier, it's very difficult to find a family show where the patriarch is painted as an intelligent provider and a leader. You know, someone who's respected by his family and peers and really cares about his health. Many times he's portrayed as an overweight, dull and insensitive buffoon. Now, according to marriage coach Brent Taylor, that image is attacking marriages. He says the entertainment industry is causing marital imbalance. If you can create, or if you can put lies in that man's head that causes him to be um, a dictator, oppressive, now he's not loving his wife. So the teeter-totter is in this direction. And then if you can put lies in females' heads that, you know, we've got the victim pity party going on. We're, we we got to fight for our rights. So now the teeter-totter is going to go in the other way. Now we got the woman power thing. And what people don't realize, that's actually emasculating the men. So men were too much this way, and now we got too much this way. And Candace always said, you know, where's all the good men? Well, it's only masculinity that fosters and validates femininity. And it's only femininity that fosters and validates masculinity. And the key word is foster. Brent Taylor will also discuss personality and gender differences and why the husband's greatest need is significance. That full interview with BCN's Naveen Day is coming up later in our broadcast. While the extreme cold warning continued for much of southwestern Alberta again today, those frigid temperatures will last well into the weekend. All of the weather details are on deck.
It has been very cold and snowy here in Lethbridge. The extreme cold warning from Environment Canada continued for our region. Jeanette Roche is now with all of the weather details. Jeanette, some good news and bad news for the weekend. The good news is there should be lots of sunshine for Lethbridge, but the bad news is we can see wind chill values near minus 40 once again. Yeah, try minus 50 on a Saturday morning, Hal, and then minus 36 by uh, the afternoon. And uh, yeah, we're just in for it this weekend, aren't we? Uh, we are looking at a daytime high of minus 28 on Saturday. But you know, like you were saying before as well, the good news is the sunshine. So we might be able to catch those suspended ice crystals that are in the ice fog that is supposed to happen tonight and into tomorrow morning. Minus 30 for an expected high on Sunday, minus 17 on Monday. So this is where it's gonna warm up a bit by Tuesday, mainly cloudy, minus six, and then back to minus 13 for Wednesday and Thursday. We are, of course, supposed to see more flurries develop midweek as well as 60% chance. So uh, average high for this time of year, minus 2, average low, minus 14, 14. That was our high temperature on this day back in 1987 and 1998. We had our chilliest on record, which was minus 39. Okay, so the sun rose this morning at 825, one minute uh, earlier than it did yesterday and uh, the sun set one minute later so meaning we have actually eight hours and 30 minutes of daylight today two minutes longer than we did yesterday okay so bc is still under that arctic outflow warning meaning that uh, arctic air is mixing with strong winds to bring wind chill values down to minus 20 in that region actually in the fraser valley area even colder minus 25 to minus 30 wind chill so that is expected to last until saturday and the regions expected to be hit are metro vancouver the greater victoria area the southern gulf islands as well as the fraser valley region so lots happening along that bc southern coast there now in alberta we are still under an extreme cold warning so both edmonton and calgary looking at wind chill values tomorrow in the high minus 40s like minus 40. 47 in Edmonton, minus 48 in Calgary. Of course, as we get into Lethbridge, we're looking at wind chill of minus 50. Funny how it gets a little bit colder the further south that you get. Same thing in Saskatchewan, also looking at extreme cold uh, warnings and affect wind chill values in the high minus 40s. These are actually the daytime highs here, minus 33 Saskatoon, minus 31 Regina. Regina could see some flurries. Also periods of snow uh, ending by the afternoon in Winnipeg with a high of minus 19. As we look to Toronto, Toronto seeing rain mixed with snow minus, uh, or that's a plus two there uh, in Toronto. Ottawa looking at 60k winds, also looking at a winter storm warning. Could see a uh, snowfall developing there, five centimeters in town, but as we get into the regions, they're looking at 25 centimeters of snowfall, one degree for a high there. Same thing for Montreal, one degree. Montreal under a snowfall warning could see some heavy snowfall in the Montreal region there. Fredericton looking at a risk of freezing rain, also some snow and ice pellets, expecting up to 10 centimeters of those ice pellets tomorrow. Minus one for expected high there in Fredericton. Halifax looking at a high of three degrees, looking at a severe rain as well. Could see up to 25 millimeters of rain along the Atlantic coast there, more like five millimeters in town. Charlottetown also looking at uh, ice pellets and snow and minus two for a high and minus four for a high in St. John's. Newfoundland could see some sunny, sunny skies there. No precipitation expected there. There you go. That is your weather forecast. Quaker Canada is recalling dozens of cereals and granola bars due to possible salmonella contamination. The recall includes Harvest Crunch cereals, Chewy granola bars, Dips granola bars, yogurt granola bars, and Captain Crunch treat bars. They all have best before dates ranging from January 11th to October of this year. Quaker says it issued the recall out of an abundance of caution. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency says there have been no reported illnesses so far. The Canada Energy Regulator is slated to hear oral arguments from the company building the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. The Crown Corporation behind the project, Trans Mountain, has run into difficulties drilling through Hard Rock in British Columbia and is requesting a pipeline variance. It is asking permission to use a different size of pipe for a 2.3 kilometer stretch of pipeline. The regulator previously denied that request, citing concerns around safety and pipeline integrity. But Trans Mountain has said it now believes that without the change, the project could face a two-year delay in completion. Social media giant Meta is offering $51 million to settle a lawsuit in four provinces, including Manitoba and Saskatchewan. 
The case involves Facebook's Sponsored Stories advertising program, which ran from 2011 to 2014 and used people's names and photos without their knowledge. Christopher Rohn, a lawyer representing the plaintiffs, says the proposed settlement sends a strong message to other companies about the importance of paying attention to Canadian privacy laws. The legal action filed by a BC woman was expanded in 2019 to include residents of Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Newfoundland and Labrador. Tesla says it is temporarily halting most of production at its German factory because of attacks in the Red Sea. It says its production is affected because shipping between Europe and Asia is now being forced to go around the Cape of Good Hope. Tesla says the significantly longer transport times creates a gap in supply chains. The electric vehicle maker says its factory near Berlin, which makes Model Y vehicles and batteries, will pause production from January 29th to February the 11th. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 71 points on the day to finish at 20,990. The Dow was down 118 points to 37,592. The S&P 500 was up three on the day to 4783, and the NASDAQ was up two points to 14,972. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up 80 cents to 7282 US per barrel. Natural gas was up 23 cents to 333 US. Gold was up $20.15 to $2,049.06 US an ounce, and silver was up 44 cents to 2319 US an ounce. Feed wheat is at $8.84 per bushel, barley's at $6.53, canola's at $13.97, and corn is at $8.11 per bushel. Live cattle February contract was down 43 cents to $1.7138. Feeder cattle were up 30 cents to $2.2658, and lean hogs February contract was down 70 cents to $71.90. The Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours to 74.57 US. Recapping one of our top stories, the extreme cold warning from Environment Canada continues for much of southwestern Alberta. Expect overnight lows near minus 40 degrees, not including the wind chill factor. The temperatures are not expected to warm up until at least Monday when we should hit minus 17. Tuesday even warmer with a high near minus 6 degrees expected. Can't wait. Getting a good night's rest is key to living a healthy lifestyle. Now that's according to sleep and insomnia expert Lana Walsh. She'll have more details in an interview with BCN's Naveen Day shortly. Listen, when you see news happening in your community, be sure to send us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. And if you missed any of our local stories, visit our website, bridgecitynews.ca. Here's today's Bridge City News community calendar. The Southern Alberta Ethnic Association presents Celebrating Everything Scottish on Saturday, January 20th at the Multicultural Centre. Doors open at 5.30pm with dinner and entertainment beginning at 6.30. Enjoy an exciting evening with a traditional Scottish dinner. Performances by the Lethbridge Highland Dance Association. Live music by the Celtic Roots, Bagpipers, A Toast to the Haggis and more. For tickets, visit saea.ca or call 403-320-1577. Henderson Lake Park Run invites all to throw in a pair of runners and participate in a free weekly computer-timed and recorded 5-kilometer walk, jog, or run. The Park Run is one of 2,100 park runs held around the world. Dogs on leashes and kids in strollers are welcome too. The Park Run begins at the Kinsman Picnic Shelter at 9 a.m. every Saturday. To register, visit parkrun.ca. Big Brothers, Big Sisters and Lethbridge is looking for volunteers to mentor children and youth in their various programs. Volunteers commit to one visit per week for one year. They have many kids that are looking for a big brother or sister. Make a difference in a child's life and start something big. To apply, visit lethbridge.bigbrothersbigsisters.ca and for more information, call 403-328-9355. And that's today's Bridge City News Community Calendar. You know, nothing feels better than waking up after a great night's sleep. Yet, there are some disorders that can hamper that awesome feeling you experience after several hours of lovely rest. Lena Walsh is a local sleep expert and she has dedicated her career to help people overcome insomnia and other sleep disorders. With years of experience in the field, Walsh developed effective protocols that can help individuals get the restful and rejuvenating sleep that they need to lead healthy and fulfilling lives. Lana, 
Welcome to Bridge City News. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to chat with you today. Of course. Now, first off, can you just share your experience in your quest for sleep? Yeah, well, my quest for sleep lasted a really long time, about 30 years. Wow. Uh, I remember as a kid tossing and turning so much at night, and I'd have to get out of bed to rearrange my clothes because they'd get wrapped tight around me, and it would drive me crazy. And I, over the years, I started to develop troubles, um, ongoing troubles with staying asleep. So I'd wake up in the middle of the night, and I'd toss and turn for hours. And I couldn't, some nights couldn't go back to sleep at all. So during 30 years, I've been sleep tested. I've seen a sleep expert. I've been on a decade's worth of medication with no solution. And then by complete happenstance or maybe divine intervention, I found the solution to insomnia, which is actually the gold standard in treating insomnia now. So using this um, process of behavior change completely cured my sleeping problems. And it's been an amazing three years of sleep. I can't even tell you how incredible the last three years have been for me. Well, I, I'm really, I'm really interested in hearing more about that. But uh, what was the feeling like of not being being able to find like that really like helpful rest? Well, I tell you, there's a lot of things that happen when you don't sleep at night. Um, first of all. You just feel exhausted all the time. I, For good sleepers out there, I explain it like if you ever had a newborn baby at home and you remember how exhausting it was every day for the first months that the baby kept waking up every two hours to eat, that's what insomnia is like. Even when you have a good night's sleep, because you get those every once in a while too, you still feel exhausted all the time. Right. But some of the ways that it affects you though is mostly in your brain. Like your brain is most affected by sleep. It's um, it happens quickly too. like one night of bad sleep will make you moody. I was very irritable. Um, you didn't even want to look at me in the mornings because I might take your head off. I was just so grumpy all the time. <laughs> right. But you get brain fog. Um, your memory kind of goes. I, you know, one of the biggest things that I noticed when I started sleeping better was my memory. Because I would have a conversation just like this and I would come up to a word that I wanted to say and I couldn't think of the word. Oh. And then now I don't have that problem anymore. Or if, you know, I had a stressful night and maybe had a bad night's sleep for whatever reason, that'll come back right away. That's the first thing I notice that goes for me. So there's just like your brain is really, it really affects the brain when you can't get a good night's sleep. Now, this must have been a challenge for your family. Like, what can you tell us about the impact of lack of sleep and our relationships? Yeah, well, like I said, I was I was grumpy and irritable all the time. Um, you did not even want to make a joke about me being tired. Uh, you didn't want to make a like I'm not a morning person. You're not a morning person. You said that to me. I I wanted to punch you in the throat. I really did. <laughs> um, you know, you you don't have patience. So um, there's an American Academy of Psychology found that getting less than eight hours of sleep made you almost twice as likely to lose your patience and yell at your kids. So you just, you, because you're, you're irritable all the time and you don't feel good and you have no energy, you just don't care. You, you have this, I don't care what you want. I don't care about anything. Just shut up and don't talk to me. Don't look at me feeling. And when you're doing that with people that you love the most, it's, it can be really hurtful. Now, what about uh, workplace relationships? Uh, like, is, is there like a, a way to tell when a coworker like has like a lack of ability to sleep? Yeah, so one of the ways you might notice it um, is people that are like drinking lots of extra coffee in the afternoon, because in the afternoon, our energy levels dip automatically, even if you are a good sleeper. But if you're a poor sleeper, that afternoon dip is very significant to the point where they might be falling asleep at their desk or in a meeting, right? They're, um, they're moody. They're, their moods will go up and down depending on how well they slept the night before. So you'll notice that as well. Um, they do small mistakes, like they're sending that email without the attachment regularly or you know, hitting reply all instead of just reply, like those kinds of little mistakes, um, they will be a little bit irritable or grumpy. Um, they might you know, snap 
um, in certain situations, especially if there's a difficult client or um, difficult coworker, they're less able to handle that. They may take longer to complete tasks, like something that would normally take them, they would do pretty quickly and all of a sudden it's taking them longer. Um, extra sick days. Uh, I, I probably took twice as many sick days as the average person because I just have such bad nights of sleep that I, I just couldn't function. So those would be some of the things that you would notice. So in the workplace, uh, do you think that there are things that employers or coworkers might be able to do to help a colleague that has insomnia? Well, I think the biggest thing to do is to just, when people are saying, I'm tired all the time, I'm tired all the time, is to ask them like, what's that about? Like, how long has that been going on? Is, um, is there, and ask them if they're sleeping okay, like directly ask them. Cause I can tell you in my experience, I didn't tell people I had insomnia. I, I talk to people now who worked with me 10, 15 years ago, and they say, I had no idea you had insomnia, Lana. So I never told anybody. It's not, you can't phone into work and say, I didn't sleep last night, so I can't come into the office. It's not a valid, it's not perceived as a valid excuse. So, 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 so how, how do you open up that conversation then? Like saying like, uh, like I have insomnia, like at work. Mm hmm yeah, well, I would just ask them when, when somebody's saying to you, like, I'm tired all the time, I'm tired all the time, I would just ask them, like, well, how are you sleeping? And, you know, are you get, do you know if you're getting enough sleep? Or do you know if maybe that might be a problem for you? Because I knew I had insomnia, I was reading everything I could find online, but I couldn't find a solution. And if you know somebody that could help them, then give them the, the opportunity to say, hey, I know I know this is bad. I know how hard it is, but you know what? I heard about this person who helps people do this, you know, and, and give them that opportunity because when I would tell, if I told somebody, actually, I should say this. The one time I told my boss that I had trouble sleeping, she asked me why I couldn't just close my eyes and go to sleep at night. That's the kind of advice you get from people who don't understand what's happening and so you don't tell anybody because there's no reason to right. tell them. So if you know, if you're listening to this, you can say to people, hey, you know what? I know somebody who's actually a specialist in this and can maybe help you because what I do is considered the gold standard in treating insomnia, but it's only been that standard since 2016. So lots of medical professionals out there don't even know about this treatment. So let, let's talk a little bit about the treatment now, because I, you've obviously like overcome a lot of things, and I really want to hear more about that. Yeah, so what research has come to realize is that insomnia is a learned behavior. What happens is we start out having trouble sleeping for a variety of reasons. Mostly it's stress related. Stress is the number one reason people can't sleep and even good sleepers will have trouble sleeping when they're under stress. And that's completely normal. But when we have trouble sleeping and it goes on for weeks or months, what happens for a certain part of the population is they start to get frustrated and anxious and then they anticipate not sleeping. So then every day they're thinking about sleep all the time. And am I gonna sleep tonight? And is tonight the night I'm finally gonna get a good night's sleep? And because we're so exhausted every day, we start to engage in a bunch of behaviors and habits to help us survive, mm -hmm. but actually contribute to our insomnia. Oh. So then what happens is our subconscious brain starts to associate bed and nighttime with being awake. So just like Pavlov's dog learned to salivate at the sound of a bell, we've done the same thing with sleep. Our, for insomniacs, we get this hyperactive part of our brain that won't shut down at night. And it just keeps us awake through the night. And so the treatment is to reprogram that subconscious brain. And that involves sleep education. So just even just understanding that little bit, right, helps. It's understanding how sleep works, why things are happening the way they're happening, and why you should do something different, specific strategies to do at night, and then stress reduction and relaxation techniques. That's the whole process into a step-by-step -step plan that gets you back on track. So how, how does technology affect our sleep and our ability to sleep? Because like, I mean, like 
a lot of us like we'll, we'll go to bed and we'll like stare at our phones, we'll check our Facebook, we'll check our Twitter, we'll do like like a bunch of Instagram stuff, and uh, that's probably not really health like like healthy for us, isn't it? isn't it? Yeah. So I mean, there's the one side of it is you know blue light affects melatonin production. It can stop melatonin production. So on that hand, you know blue light too close to your eyes has that effect on you. So you know use the night uh, vision or where you turn it to a black screen or blue light blocking lenses can help that. The bigger problem with using your phone and being on Instagram is scrolling has been shown to give you a dopamine hit, which elevates your senses. It elevates your excitement. It makes you energized. So it like, it gives you a boost as opposed to helping you calm down and relax. The other issue with certain media is it can also be stressful, right? If depending on what right. you're consuming at night, I tell people all the time, whether it's on a phone, in a book, a TV show, you have to be careful of what you consume at night. Don't have those really deep conversations with your spouse in bed. Don't do work at night because it really activates your brain and it can cause a stress reaction. And that stress reaction is part of the reason why people can't sleep. So be careful of what you consume at night, um, not just because of the blue light, but because of the information that's coming out of that device that you're looking at. So prior to going to bed, is there like a certain amount of time like you should like shut off your phone or like put it away before going to bed? Like, like would you say like an hour or two hours? Like what, what, would, what would you recommend? Well, I recommend at least an hour, uh, but it's really, it's really up to you. I, I don't, I also tell people if watching TV helps you go to sleep at night, then watch TV, right? I, I don't want people to just all of a sudden change their habits because, you know, of some recommendation. I want it, you to get your best sleep. So do the thing that helps you go to sleep, but it, you should be doing something relaxing. If you're not giving yourself that opportunity to settle down, to get out of active functioning time to go to sleep, it's going to be harder to go to sleep. So I do recommend like a half an hour, shut off your phone and do something relaxing like reading because that will help your brain settle down and get into that mode of ready to sleep because it needs that time to just come down from the day. Right. So we've talked about like, uh, like uh, taking technology away. Um, like an hour before sleeping. Uh, what are like other things that can help someone fall asleep and have a good night's rest? Well, I think one of the biggest things you can do is stick to a routine. Um, when you, your circadian rhythm runs on a 24 hour clock. And so when you disrupt that rhythm by going to bed later or sleeping in or going to bed too early, it really disrupts that natural rhythm. So the first thing is to pick a bedtime and stick to it. And then give yourself a routine of things that you do before bed that you do every time you go to bed. Because your, your brain craves that routine and it will start to learn, just like we learned how not to sleep, it will learn over time that, okay, this is the pattern that we follow before we go to sleep. So for me, it doesn't matter what time I go to bed, if I was out drinking and partying, I read at least 15 minutes before bed. I might not remember what I read, but you know, I'll do it. <laughs> but I read at least 15 minutes before bed because that is my routine and it actually puts me to sleep. Oh. So just finding that thing that you do and do it over and over and over again, and that will help you fall asleep faster. Wow, okay, so Lana, uh, we're just about out of, out of time, but if viewers wanna get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, well, I'm on all the social channels at Lana Walsh Coaching, and my uh, website is lanawalshcoaching.ca. So you can find me on any of those, and I'd be happy to chat with you if you want. We all know that people have different personalities, but do we know to what extent this can impact marital relationships? And perhaps more controversially, there are gender differences which can also impact marriage. Joining us to discuss this is Brent Taylor. He is a Lethbridge marriage coach and the author of His and Hers Greatest Need. Brent, 
Welcome to BCN. So great to have you back. Thanks, Naveen. It's uh, great to be here and great to meet you. Thank you for having me. Now, Brent, first of all, can you briefly share a bit about what you do to help couples improve their relationships? Well, I would say there's a few different things, but one of them is to truly understand each other as best as they can, to give them that insight. You, you truly understand someone when they understand that you understand them. And so I share with them the insight in a very broad and deep level, probably more than most. There's a lot of different uh, tools and insights and, and things that I use to help them understand each other. And then I help to inspire them. Um, I coached hockey for 13 years and I realized inspiration precedes perspiration. Hmm. So uh, I help to inspire them and help them to really understand the motive is the key to everything. I had a large manufacturing company and people knew what to do and how to do it. That's very important. And most men are about how to do something. But there's no motive behind the how. There's no passion behind the how. It's process-based. And men tend to be more that way. But the key is getting to the heart. So when we, when we have inspiration at the heart level, then that fuels the, the power that's needed to really work on the hows and the whats. So I help people say, so what do you do? I help get to their heart. I help get to their want button. I help them want to love one another. It's interesting what you said about how men are very um, process oriented because it seems like a lot of us guys, when we see a problem, we approach it like a problem with our car. Like when your car is broken, find the problem, order the part, install the car part, car fix. And you can't really do that with your, with your spouse. Like, oh, wife broken, discover problem, order part, order flowers, wife fixed. You can't really do that, can you? N not like that. Yes, we can, um, because what we give is what she receives. And she was designed to receive uh, a certain character, a certain trait, a certain um, love, if you will. And that's why there's 14 elements in the definition of love, which is a wedding vow. There's 14 so I encourage men to learn each one of those 14. Um, when you realize it's actually who you were designed to be, it's your nature to be that way. Uh, and you realize the gift that you're going to get, not because you want to get anything from your wife, but the joy you're going to have inside by seeing your wife shine is going to be worth it. And so, you know, love is patient, love is kind, it's content, it's not boastful, it's forgiving, it's honest, there's a whole variety of things. So when men realize this is what their wife is looking for, to receive that, because the woman is a crowning jewel of beauty and creation. They're the greatest team between two human beings. But when she shines, that's when men are happy. And that, that old saying, you know, happy wife, happy life, don't say that with a tongue in cheek. It's actually true. The man was actually designed to give love to his wife, and she was designed to receive it. And when she receives it, she shines. So when she's not really shining, she's kind of like a multiplier. There's a speaker that says, you know, you give her a seed, she gives you a baby. You give her a house, she gives you a home. You give her food, she gives you a meal. You give her frustration, what is she going to give you? You know, it's when you give her love, what is she going to shine with? So men don't realize that they are actually the initiator of loving unity. They just need to learn what that love looks like and practice it in a way that she can receive and you'll be, you'll be filled with joy because she is shining. I really like what you said there about how like whatever you give women, uh, your wife will grow like, and uh, whatever, whatever you sow, you'll reap and you'll reap, uh, you'll reap uh, multiple fold. Now, what kind of feedback are you getting from those who have read your book, taken some classes and watched the videos? Well, from those that have read the book that are married, they said it saved their marriage. Uh, um, and my video, uh, there was, I did a talk at the Yates Theater about a month and a half, two months ago. And one of the men uh, was listening to my ad on the radio and he, um, went to actually to my website, found the 17 minute video and he went to his wife 
and they were really struggling, 15 years of marriage. And he said, can we watch this? And interestingly enough, so she ordered the video in the book. She couldn't find the link. I called her. She did wind up getting the link. And when I called her, she said her and her husband watched it together. She said it was amazing. And the interesting part was she was actually going to walk out the door that day. It was a Sunday and they watched the video today that day and they said, we're going to watch it for the next couple of months, every Sunday together. The video is very profound. It's very simple. It's diagram friendly. It's easy to understand. It's 17 minutes. So I've numerous people have watched it. A couple in Ontario, they said, Brent, this isn't worth $29 because that's all it costs. It's worth thousands of dollars. We watched it twice in one weekend and it blew our mind. Amazing. So the video along with the book, you know, in my view, if you're willing to really practice and do the right things, you can probably sell, save yourself a lot of time and money from going to see a counselor. Um, and you can probably put your marriage right back on track with the video and the book. Now, yes, sometimes it might take a little bit more. Uh, some people are stubborn and selfish and they don't want to really put the work in. But once you realize how amazing this is, I think most couples will want to do it. Now, I do want to get into talking about personality and gender differences, but before we get into that, you write in your book that the greatest need for the husband is significance. Can you explain what you mean by husbands needing significance? Well, men generally, okay, I'll, I'll explain the difference between significance and security. So if a man and woman were to go to New York into the dark, deep slums of New York and the bad part of town and it's midnight and they're staying in a junky hotel and the woman's going to go for a walk by herself at midnight in that junky area of town all by herself. Do you think she's going to want to go? No. Probably not. Would the man go for a walk by himself? Probably. He might look around the corner, but he probably would. Or if a man and woman that don't know each other are walking down the street together and they're going to cross each other in that dark slum area... Who do you think is going to be more afraid of the other? The wife. She is wired by design to pay attention. In the Hebrew, when it says it's not good for the man to be alone, I'll make him a help meet. In the Hebrew, Azer Konegdo, Azer is the same word used for the Holy Spirit. If women knew what who they really were, they wouldn't be competing. Azer is the same word for the Holy Spirit. She has amazing spiritual intuition that men probably don't have. And they have a protection role. Conegdo means she protects, not so much with her bronze, but with her brains. The frontal part of the lobe is wired for consequential thinking, safety, and security. She wants to protect the little ones. She even wants to protect her husbands. Most women say, take care, make sure. And most men say, go for it. What was I thinking? Men want to take the risk. We need to take risk in life but you want to mitigate the risk. She was designed to complete him to help him mitigate the risk. So her consequential thinking is going about safety and security. Another proof, little Johnny's climbing up a tree and mama bear comes by and says, Johnny, six years old, you better get down from the tree. You're going to break a leg. He hadn't thought about breaking his leg until she mentioned the proverbial seed. Boom, he falls, breaks a leg. But she's worried about his safety and security. Papa bear usually comes by and says, Hey, great job, son. If you reach here and here, you can go higher. He wants to, to conquer. He wants to, you know, explore. He wants to, that's his significance. But the, the number one person he wants to be significant to is his wife. He wants to be your hero. You tell me a man that doesn't want to be his wife's hero. It seems like uh, when you watch a lot of movies and uh, especially like movies like, uh, like, brave heart uh, it, it's it's always around this theme that it's it's a battle to win a beauty to rescue and an adventure to live and that really defines what what manhood is all about when you watch these movies w w would you agree with that i 100 I, i'd say god's a romantic you know like he 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 res he rescues us right and the husband was designed to i mean there's not a woman in the world that doesn't want to be fought for she wants to know that she is his crowning jewel. She wants to know that he's going to, he's going to, he's going to fight for her. And what most men don't realize is they, they get, they get the, the beautiful wife and then they kind of stop fighting, meaning they start pursuing, they, they don't really pursue her heart. 
This is a lifelong pursuit of her heart. She wants to know that you cherish her for your whole life. And, and men do, but they think, okay, yeah, I told you when we got married that I love you. If it changes, I'll let you know. You know, it's not something that men are always in tune with, but the man was designed to be loving his wife on a daily basis. And a woman is a barometer of a man's character. She knows if he's on track or not. If his behaviors are, are not kind, if they're not honest, if they're not of integrity, um, they're not compassion, they're not committed, they're not devoted, he's wandering off doing things he shouldn't be doing, she knows it. She can read his character very keenly. She's very sensitive. Women are very sensitive in every facet. Smell, sense, touch, character, everything. They were wired to be that sensitive. She lets her husband know. So I say, guys, you look at your wife in the eyes and you ask her, how are we doing? How am I doing? How can I love you better? But the piece that the ladies don't know, they're also the fuel. Mm. They put the fuel in the jets. And when they put their fuel in his jets, he wants to go to the moon for her. Remember, he's not for himself. He wants to go for her and with her. But he likes it when she puts the fuel in his jets because it pumps him up. Okay, so we've talked about uh, the positive side of how men can be inspired by entertainment, uh, you know, with a, a, a battle to win, a beauty to rescue, and an, and an adventure to live. What about uh, TV shows that are really portraying men in a very negative fashion where the, where the, the, the patriarch of the home is this dull, overweight, stupid, buffoon how does that affecting men and how is it affecting their marriages right well first and foremost we have to look at the greatest creation of all the number one creation of all is husband and wife man and woman there's no other creation made in god's image and god is love so if you can take out the leader what happens to the rest of the world if you can take out the, the 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 way that the man was designed to love his bride to rescue his bride to cherish his bride to be her hero if you can take him out if you can create or if you can put lies in that man's head that causes him to be um a dictator oppressive now he's not loving his wife so the teeter-totter is in this direction and then if you can put lies in females heads that, you know, we've got the victim pity party going on. We're, we we got to fight for our rights. So now the teeter-totter is going to go in the other way. Now we got the woman power thing. And what people don't realize, that's actually emasculating the men. So men were too much this way, and now we got too much this way. And Candace always said, you know, where's all the good men? Well, it's only masculinity that fosters and validates femininity. And it's only femininity that fosters and validates masculinity. And the key word is foster. The key word is foster. You know, we weren't given a kitchen table. We were given a tree. Right? We're mini creators. We're mini builders. We, we, we're made in his image to, to, to build, to develop. Well, God doesn't give you that perfect wife at the beginning. You develop her. And she develops you. It's your design as a man that will develop her as a woman. And it's her design as a woman that will develop you as a man. Now, I, I ask a lot of couples, who did God make first? Man. Who did he make last? Woman. Is one more important than the other? No. But there's an order of sequence. If you were to ask your wife, or if a man was to ask his wife to go for a dance and he puts his arm out, ask her to go for a dance, she puts her hand in his elbow. Side by side, but he made the offer. Right. He's the sender, she's the receiver. Check out the anatomy. There's an order. The man was to teach, but not preach. He was to teach by showing his wife what this amazing love is that he's been given to her. I asked a bunch of ministers one time, why did God give man woman? Oh, she's my helpmate. What she can do for me. Wrong attitude. From, yes, she is a helpmate. She's your teammate. 
But the key is that would be self-seeking. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not what you can do for me. Love is what can I do for you? He was given woman to love her, for her to receive that love and shine, reflect it back to him and them both to their children. So it's only the masculinity. So a woman, every woman wants a confident man, a mature man, a man who takes initiative. Well, if he's passive, if he's a buffoon, if he doesn't know who he is, he doesn't necessarily need to draw strength from her, even though she does fill his, his jets, he needs to bring strength. A lot of women think, oh, I want my husband or man to be vulnerable. I would caution ladies on saying that because women, they, they want a man to be open to her vulnerability. They want him to be sensitive, but not needy. They want him to be strong and sensitive. And if you think about it, they're looking for Christ in their husband. It says husbands love their wives as Christ loved the church. It doesn't say wives love their husband. Who gave their life for their wife? The husband was designed to give his wife for his life. Here's an example. If you have the Titanic and it's going down, you see the movie, the Titanic? Let's pretend we got two captains, not one. We got two. Okay. Male and, fe male and female. It's going down. Everybody's jumping on lifeboats. One lifeboat, room for one more person to get on the lifeboat. Man and woman captain looking at each other. Who do you think is going to say, you take the last spot on that lifeboat? The man. The man. Better be the man. And who do you think is going to accept his offer and be dropping tears down her face when she floats away, saying, wow, that's a man who, who loves. Right. The man is a leader, not because he puts himself first. He's the leader because he puts himself last. He, me first loses. Me last wins. Brent Taylor is a marriage, a Lethbridge marriage coach and the author of His and Hers Greatest Need, available at hisandhers.ca. Brent, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. I'm Naveen Day. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, thanks for watching. <laughs>